Hello friends. Many of you have been eagerly asking for more parts of our Asia Fundamentals exam practice question series since we took down our old videos. Well, your wait is over. We are back with another installment packed with questions focused on key exam topics. Remember, even though our old videos are no longer available, you can still access all the questions in PDF format. Simply join our gold membership and email us at devopsup2023 at gmail.com to request your copy. Now let's dive right into the questions for this part of the series. Question number 21. You have an on-premise network with multiple servers that you intend to move entirely to Azure. What should you include in your recommendation to ensure certain servers remain accessible in case a single Azure data center experiences a prolonged outage? And your options are fault tolerance, scalability, low latency, elasticity. The key thing here is you need to provide a solution which ensures the servers are still available even if an Azure data center is offline, which means we are looking for a solution that provides fault tolerance, which refers to the ability of a system. A system can be a computer, network, cloud cluster, or anything else to continue operating without interruption when one or more of its components fail. You need to perform a lift and shift migration for an on-premise server. Which type of cloud service should you use? Your options are basically three cloud computing models, which are infrastructure as a service, software as a service, or platform as a service. And friends, for a lift and shift migration of an on-premise server, you should make use of infrastructure as a service cloud service model. This is the fastest and least expensive method of migrating an application or workload to the cloud. Without refactoring the underlying architecture, you can increase the scale and performance, enhance the security and reduce the costs of running an application or workload. Let's look at question number 23. Which responsibility is shared between Microsoft and the customer in the software as a service cloud service model? And your options are application management, information and data management, identity and directory infrastructure management, operating system updates. And folks, the correct answer here would be option C, identity and directory infrastructure management. All the other three options are either completely customer's responsibility or Microsoft's responsibility in SaaS model. Friends, I already have explained shared responsibility model and how to approach these questions in detail in the previous parts of the series. So do not forget to check them out as well to understand how to approach these questions. Next question. Your organization utilizes Azure as its cloud provider and has set up a virtual machine with SQL database installed on it. Who is responsible for the data ingested into the database? Your options are the cloud service provider, the organization using Azure, a third party data management company, both the cloud service provider and the organization. Friends, no matter which Azure service type you use, whether it's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or software as a service, data ingestion is always the responsibility of consumers. So the correct answer is option B, the organization using Azure. Though it doesn't matter in this question, but if you don't already know, SQL database installed on a virtual machine is an example of infrastructure as a service. Question number 25. Microsoft Entra ID provides authentication services for Azure and Microsoft 365. You need to tell whether this statement is right or wrong. And friends, this is a correct statement. It provides services such as single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, and conditional access, ensuring secure and streamlined access to resources across Azure and Microsoft 365 ecosystems. Let's look at another statement. Serverless computing is an example of consumption-based model. Print serverless computing is built based on per second resource consumption and execution. So yes, this is an example of consumption-based plan. 
Some of the example of serverless services in Azure are functions, web apps, event grids. Now let's look at next question. The SLA in Azure is a formal agreement between Microsoft and the customer. Which factor is addressed in the SLA? And your options are scalability, elasticity, availability, durability. SLA, which is service level agreement in Azure specifies the guaranteed uptime and reliability of Azure services. This agreement outlines the expected level of service performance, including the percentage of time that the services will be available to the customer. Availability is a critical factor because it directly impacts the reliability and continuity of services provided by Azure. Other factors such as scalability, elasticity and durability are important aspects of cloud services. But the SLA specifically focuses on the availability to ensure that the services remain accessible and operational as per the defined standards. So folks, I hope you now understand why I have chosen option C availability as the correct answer in this case. But if you still have any doubts, please post them in the comment section. Let's head to question number 28 of the series. Which of the following is the best method for companies to ensure they only deploy cost effective virtual machine SKU sizes? And your options are periodically inspect the deployment manually to see which SKU sizes are used. Create a Azure policy that specifies the allowed SKU sizes. Create an Azure RBAC role that defines the allowed virtual machine SKU sizes. And friends, the correct answer here is option B. Azure policy allows organizations to enforce governance and compliance standards across their Azure environments by creating a policy that specifies the allowed virtual machine SKU sizes companies can ensure that only cost effective options are deployed. So friends, let's now understand which is the policy that you will use in this case. So what we will do is we are already into the Azure portal. We will go into authoring and click on definition so that we can see the definition of the policy and the policy that you would use in this case is allowed virtual machine SKUs. So I just typed it in the search bar and there are two different policies that you can use here. One is more focused around lab services. If you are working in a lab environment, you could use this, but we are going to use the actual one, which is allowed virtual machine size SKUs and its category is compute. What we'll do is we'll click on this policy and in the description, you can see it says this policy enables you to specify a set of virtual machine size SKUs that your organization can deploy. Now the organization in the, that we were talking about in our question wanted to uh, allow only cost effective virtual machine SKU sizes. So when you apply this policy, when you assign this policy, you get an option to specify which of the SKUs are allowed. Now based on the organization policy, they can only uh, allow the SKUs which seem cost effective to them. So how they are going to do it? We will click on assign policy and then it will present you with a different set of options. Now you will define the scope on which you want to apply this policy. For example, I want to apply it at subscription level, then you will choose subscription and you don't really need to choose anything in resource group. But if you want to uh, take it a further level down and want to apply it to a particular resource group, you can do that as well. So let's use cloud shell 1407 resource group in my case, then you have an option to specify the exclusions as well. Uh, for example, uh, you are applying it on a resource group, but you want to optionally exclude a particular resource from this assignment. You can do that. You can see there are certain resource in my resource group. If I want, I can probably uh, exclude uh, any of the resources here, though I don't have any virtual machine. So it doesn't really matter whether I uh, choose anything or not. Now the main thing was uh, how do you specify the SKUs that are allowed. So for that you will go into the parameters section and here you can see allowed S size SKUs. They, you have a drop down from which you can choose 
which all SKUs are allowed. It will list you all the available SKUs for virtual machines throughout Azure. And for example, you just want to allow basic underscore A0 and basic underscore A1. You can choose that and you can see it says as two selected and then uh, you can pretty much review and create it. Now we are not going to do that at this point, but the main idea was to tell you uh, which policy will be used in this case and how you can apply it. And you, you do have options to apply it at different levels. Let's now head back to the questions. Question number 29. Which of the following allows you to group virtual machines into an update domain or a fault domain? And your options are availability zones, availability sets, Azure load balancer, Azure virtual machine scale sets. Friends, the correct answer here would be option B, availability sets. Availability sets are logical groupings of VMs that reduce the chance of correlated failures bringing down related VMs at the same time. Each virtual machine in the availability set is assigned an update domain and a fault domain by the underlying Azure platform. Each availability set can be configured with up to three fault domains and 20 update domains. Prints make a note of these limits as these can form a different question in the Azure fundamentals exam. Next question. The cost to increase cloud computing capacity are less than the cost to increase the computing capacity of an on-premise data center. You need to tell whether this statement is right or wrong. And friends, this is a correct statement. The cost to increase cloud computing are less than the cost to increase the computing capacity of an on-premise data center. This is because cloud computing services offer pay-as-you-go pricing models, allowing organizations to scale resources up or down based on demand without the need for significant upfront investments in hardware and infrastructure. Let's look at another statement. Microsoft Entra ID groups support dynamic membership rules. And friends, this is also a correct statement. You can create attribute based rules to enable dynamic memberships for a group in Microsoft Entra ID. Dynamic group memberships adds and removes group members automatically using membership rules based on member attributes. When the attributes of a user or a device change, the system evaluates all dynamic group rules in a directory to see if the change would trigger any group adds or removes. If a user or device satisfies a rule on a group, they are added as a member of that group. If they no longer satisfy the rule, they are removed. You cannot manually add or remove a member of a dynamic group. Next question. What is the first stage in the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework for Azure? Your options are adopt the cloud, make a plan, ready your organization, define your strategy. And folks, you must make a strategy first where you define business justification and expected adoption outcomes. Let's now understand Cloud Adoption Framework in a bit more detail. So friends, in front of you is a table listing out the different stages of the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework. As I already mentioned, the first stage is define a strategy. Now in this stage, you understand your motivations, you understand your business outcomes, you provide business justification, and you try to prioritize the project. This is the phase where you are designing the strategy that what you want to do. Then the next stage is plan. In plan, you basically go through the cloud adoption plan, you go through the skills readiness plan, you do the initial organization alignment, and then you go through your digital estate. Now the next stage is you get ready. And in that you create your operating model, you design your landing zone concepts, you design your area guidance and you explore your implementation options. And then the final stage is adopt. What you do in adopt is you migrate, you modernize, you innovate. As you would have already heard about these terms, when you migrate from your on-premise to cloud, you are modernizing your applications. You are moving more towards innovations. And the three stages that are mentioned at the bottom, they 
go hand in hand in every phase in every stage you need to ensure you are talking about security you are talking about how you are going to govern how you are going to manage things now in security what you assess is you look at risk insights you look at business resilience you look towards asset protection and when it comes to talking about manage phase you are talking about business commitments operations baseline operations maturity basically when you have adopted cloud and you have already moved your workloads to azure or for other matter any other cloud vendor then you need to understand how your operations are going to work in future then the last one is govern you you have to govern what you are trying to do so basically you create policies and compliance you assess the business risks and you talk about governance maturity throughout the stages of the cloud adoption framework so, so friends the link to this microsoft documentation was already available on your screen when we were going through the correct options so i would highly recommend you to go through the cloud adoption framework to to understand it in more detail as you can get multiple variations of these questions in the exam so folks let's validate one more statement and the statement is the azure command line interface is installed by default on windows 11 and this is a incorrect statement the command line interface is a cross platform command line tool that can be installed locally on windows computers for windows the azure cli is installed via msi or a zip package which gives you access to the cli through the windows command prompt or powershell and it is an exclusive installation and doesn't come packaged with os now the next statement is an azure subscription can be associated with multiple intra id tenants this is also an incorrect statement friends an intra id tenant can have multiple subscriptions but an azure subscription can only be associated with one tenant so folks this question can be reworded into another statement and that statement will be true what would that statement be an intra id tenant can have multiple subscriptions whether this is right or wrong and that is a correct statement question number 35 Which of the following is your storage data services support synchronization between on premise storage and azure storage your options are azure blob storage azure queue storage azure table storage azure files and the correct answer here is option d azure files it utilizes azure file sync to perform synchronizations of files between an on premise file server and an azure file share providing a seamless hybrid cloud storage solution now folks other options azure blob storage is primarily used for unstructured data storage azure queue storage is used for message queuing and azure table storage is used for no sql key value data storage So I hope you now understand why option A, B, and C are not correct in this case. I hope you found the questions in this video helpful. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Your support helps us create more valuable content for you. If our content has helped you succeed, feel free to tag me in your LinkedIn success posts. This helps us grow within the community. Stay tuned for more parts in the series and. Happy learning.